Okay, we're getting ready to go here for the last of our confidence interval type uh, lectures. Um, with this one, we're going to be talking about a particular application of confidence intervals, which is how to do hypothesis testing with confidence intervals. And as I mentioned in class, to some people who were there, it works just as well in most cases as using traditional hypothesis testing. Sadly, you're still going to have to do traditional hypothesis testing and learn how to do that also, because that's what the whole world uses, even though in many cases this is just as easy. So what we know so far is that we calculate a confidence interval from a sample, and that little histogram there is to show you this is a sample, not a population. Um, and that confidence interval tells us our best guess about where mu might be. Mu is the true population mean, the, pop, the mean of the population this sample came from. So it, it's also our estimated precision of measurement of our sample mean. So we've got our sample mean right there, and we calculate a confidence interval. So the ends of the arrows are the confidence interval in this little diagram that I'm using right here. So that's what we know so far. More, more specifically, if we want to talk about the meaning of the confidence interval, we can think about oh, what are all the values inside the confidence interval between the lower and upper limits and those outside. The values inside the confidence interval, well, they're plausible. We're, when we say we're 95% confident that the true population mean lies between such and such and such and such, we're saying, uh, based on our data, based on the only evidence we have, it's plausible. It's 95% plausible to us that the true population mean might lie between these values here. So you've got your mean here, your confidence interval, and everything that is inside this, this limit between these two values is plausible as a value, as a possible value for the true population, or the true population mean. I mean, everything that's outside that, that limit, outside that red arrow, is not plausible. As far as we know, no, it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that based on our data, our best estimate is that it's not believable. It's, it's certainly not as believable that the mean could be outside this range because we're just going on the best we have. We only have one sample and that's it. So let's remember hypothesis testing. We can't just look at what look like facts. Um, for various reasons, it's useful to formulate a null hypothesis, this devil's advocate prediction what should happen in our sample or business as usual. And you remember my my example of criminal suspects. That's the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis and traditional null hypothesis testing approaches things with this kind of conditional probability. How plausible is the data we've, we've observed, or more extreme, if we assume that the null hypothesis is telling us what's really going on in the population? So if we knew, if we assume that the null hypothesis is true, so a p-value, when we calculate that, is the probability of our data, or data more extreme, if the null hypothesis is true, or given HO. So that's a p-value, probability of data given the null. And we're going to reverse that for confidence intervals. With a confidence interval, we can evaluate the plausibility of various hypothesized population means. So if somebody says, maybe the population mean is this, we can say, hmm, I don't know, how believable is it? And the way we do that is we just look and see whether it's inside the confidence interval or not. So how plausible, we're asking ourselves the question, how plausible is the null hypothesis if we assume our sample represents the true state of the population? So we reverse that conditional probability. And in fact, this is a lot closer to what we want to know when we do research. How likely is it that a certain hypothesis is true given what we know from our data. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say how believable. We're not going to calculate probabilities here. We could get specific, but we're not going to. We don't need to, actually. All we need to know is that if we have some value that's right inside the confidence interval, that's between the lower and the upper limits of the confidence interval, that value is believable as a true population mean estimate, because everything in the confidence interval is believable that it might be the true confidence in, or the true population mean, right? If we have a value outside, then that's not believable. A value outside is not plausible as the true population mean, based on what we have from our data, based on our only evidence, our only estimates so far. So we can evaluate the plausibility of the null hypothesis without actually calculating any probabilities. We just It's just a yes, no thing. Is it inside the confidence interval or not? We don't actually have to calculate any p-values, but as you'll see, we know whether p is greater or less than alpha as long as we set things up in a very specific way. So sample mean and the confidence interval, 
and then we specify a null hypothesis that we think is, you know, the way we always specify null hypotheses, this devil's advocate or business as usual type prediction. That null hypothesis is usually a statement of fact or a statement of potential fact, but it implies, and, it, and actually it doesn't work otherwise for these kinds of situations, for it to work with these situations, that hypothesis has to imply a, a value for the true population mean. Now, whenever I say mu and there's nothing attached to it, it means the true population mean. Um, but the value implied by the null hypothesis is mu zero, mu sub zero. It's the null hypothesis expected value for the, for the population mean. It's what the null hypothesis says the population should be, the population mean should be. Now the null hypothesis is actually, actually specifies a whole range of possibilities, but it has a mean. So we just look and see, is this mean inside our confidence interval or not? So our confidence interval is based on our data. The null hypothesis is not. We specify that before we collect any data in theory. Not always, but that is a good way to do it. So the logic that we're going to use for now before we get to more formal hypothesis testing is how plausible is this null hypothesis value, this mu zero, in light of our data? So if mu sub zero, if the null hypothesis implied mean is inside the confidence interval, then it's in the range of plausible values for the true population mean. So the true population mean might be the null hypothesis mean, right? So we should not reject the null hypothesis. So we've got our sample, we've got our confidence interval, we do the little sampling distribution of the mean thing to calculate our confidence interval. Uh, now we have our confidence interval. And if mu sub zero falls inside that, com that confidence interval, then we do not reject the null hypothesis because the main parameter that we're interested in in this case, the mean of the null hypothesis, the mean that the null hypothesis says the true population should have, is believable as the true population mean for us. However, if mu sub zero is not inside the confidence interval, then the null hypothesis is not a plausible possibility for the true mean, and we should reject the null hypothesis. So in this case, we calculate our confidence interval using the sampling distribution of means, and let's say the, the the mean implied by the null hypothesis is right there. That's not a plausible value for the true mean from the population. So we say this sample did not come from a population that has that mean. Now we don't know for sure, of course, because it's just a sample. There's all these probabilities, not certainties involved, but we say it's not plausible. Given our data, we reject this null hypothesis. We don't think that's where our sample came from. Please drinking your milk upstairs. Oh, goodness. Can you go clean it up, please? Use a towel. Dexter is not my nice cat. He's the cat who eats everything. So according to uh, somebody, I have a link there, but it's annoying. I don't even want to tell you. Action adventure TV shows have a mean of 27.6 violent acts per hour. This date, this date is a little bit old, with a standard deviation of 16.5. So Buffy the Vampire Slayer, if you look it up, had uh, 59 acts per episode on average. And let's assume that that's per hour, like a one hour episode, from a sample of 50 episodes that were sampled. So is Buffy more violent than average? Let's follow this logic through. through. So here's the, the sampling distribution and the confidence interval here. So the confidence interval for this sample, so the sample mean is 59, and the standard deviation, let's just assume the population standard deviation of 16.5, and we can calculate uh, confidence interval here, or 50, or sorry, 95% confidence interval, or 54.43 acts per hour up to 63.57 um, for all Buffy episodes, because this is just a sample of 50 of all the many seasons of, of Buffy. So that's our confidence interval. This is the null hypothesis value. The null hypothesis value is the average. So we're saying, is Buffy more violent than average? The null hypothesis would be no, no more violent than average. Nothing to see here, business as usual. The alternative hypothesis would be, hypothesis would be yes, more violent than average. Well, that mean is really, really not in our confidence interval. So maybe it is more violent than average. Let's go through a couple more examples, about three or four of how to use this. So back to the bat example with Dr. J that seems more ridiculous every time I do it. Uh, so we've changed the numbers here a bit from the previous time we did this. He records a frequency of 152, so a sample of 152 bat calls in New Mexico, and he gets a mean of 38.2 kilohertz. Um, the mean of 
bats in Arizona is 39.1 kilohertz with standard deviation of 8.6. He has reason to believe the variability of bat calls is the same in both states, so he uses 8.6 kilohertz as the standard deviation for his new has the population standard deviation for his New Mexico sample. So do the do the confidence interval here and see if the null hypothesis mean falls inside that and see if you can follow the logic to decide whether you should reject the confidence or reject the null hypothesis or not. Specify both the null and the alternative and then see if uh, you can come up with a conclusion to that. All right, let's walk through this. Okay, answers coming up here. Um, one thing to note oops, is that when we say a 95% confidence interval, that's the same thing as saying a non-directional or two-tailed test with alpha of 0.05. So that's our alpha. If alpha is 0.05, then we want a two-tailed test with um, a confidence level of 95, so a 0.95. So a 95% confidence interval is what we're going to test this with. So we should simulate our null and alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis would be something like New Mexico bats have the same frequency calls on average as Arizona, and the alternative would be that they're different. Now in symbols, Arizona mean um, should be the same, oh sorry, I should say New Mexico there. New Mexico mean should be the same as the Arizona. I'm sorry, this right here should say, just fix that right away. Maybe I'll edit this out, maybe I won't. Go back here. So, in symbols, then it's all about the mean, the true population mean of New Mexico back home. And 39 is the Arizona value. So we're saying the null hypothesis is that New Mexico bat calls come from a population that has the same mean as the Arizona mean, right? So it's this, they're the same kind of bats, and they're using the same kind of calls. The alternative hypothesis is they're not the same. Now, when, we, when we're using confidence intervals to test hypotheses, a confidence interval is naturally two-tailed, and so it's naturally easier to specify a two-tailed or non-directional hypothesis to test. So when we're going to use this method, we'll force even, even one-tailed or directional hypotheses into sort of a two-tailed mold. Later, we'll be more specific about that and more careful about one versus two-tailed, but for right now, we can just force it all into a two-tailed mold so that it fits the confidence interval situation. There are ways to kind of hack this just a teeny bit to make a one-tailed test work and get your alpha values right and everything, but I don't want to go through that right now. Let's just force everything to be two-tailed. So here are the results. The confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval for the mean of the New Mexico bats is 36.8 to 39.6. And the Arizona mean is right there, 39.1. That's very much in the confidence interval, so we do not reject the null hypothesis. So we retain the null hypothesis. New Mexico bats do not appear to use different frequencies from Arizona bats. That's fun. So some interesting notes. We didn't actually calculate a p-value, but we can say p is greater than 0.05 because we don't have to calculate the p-value to know, and I could go through this logic with you later, but I'm just going to say take my word for it right now. We don't have to calculate the p-value to know that p would be greater than 0.05 if the null hypothesis value is outside a 95% confidence interval. It has to work out that way. As long as you specify a two-tailed uh, alpha 0.05, 0 0.95 confidence interval type situation. And so this is the same decision. Re failing to reject the null hypothesis is it will always be exactly the same decision that we would have made if we were going to do a traditional hypothesis test. So this works just as well as a traditional hypothesis test in almost all situations. So another situation, John reads the Texans eat ice cream cones per year. So that's the Texas state average. And there's a standard deviation of 23.2 ice cream cones per year. So the residents of far Texas, they have t-shirts that say, you've gone too far. It's really horrible. The residents of far Texas, way down on the border, um, really high obesity rate in that, that city. So maybe the median, the mean number of cones per year is... Um, greater or less or different from the national average. Anyway, there's a survey, and let's say you find that 42.3 is the average of ice cream cones per year among FAR residents. So this is all going to be about what the true mean of FAR residents' ice cream cone consumption is. So let's say alpha equals 0.01, and let's ask ourselves, do FAR residents eat uh, fewer ice cream cones per year than Texans in general? Now, as I said, I'm just wanting to like fudge here and say this is clearly a directional hypothesis. It says fewer ice cream cones per year, but let's just fudge it and 
cram it into kind of a two-tailed hypothesis mold so we can go through the process of testing the hypothesis with a confidence interval without too many extra fussy details. So let's just make it two-tailed. Let's just make it a non-directional hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, the FAR residents eat no more ice cream cones per year on average than the national, actually that should be state average. And the alternative is they eat a different number of ice cream cones per year than the state average. So in symbols, um, null hypothesis says the, the true FAR mean is 50, just like the state average. The alternative hypothesis says the true FAR mean is not 50. It's either greater or less, but it's not 50. So that's how we would set up our hypotheses for these. I'm going to go ahead and show you the confidence interval, and so I hope you've worked this out for yourself at this point, so you can learn and test yourself. And here's the confidence interval that I calculated: 36.32, and nine, should be a 99% confidence interval. I'm thinking if I did that right. 36.3 and 48.3. That's the 99% confidence interval for number of cones eaten by far residents in this fake and made-up data that I'm presenting to you. Our null hypothesis value was out here; it was 50. I think I didn't get that quite aligned with 50, but it's close enough. So our null hypothesis expected value, the mean according to the null hypothesis was 50, and that is not inside our confidence interval. So we should reject that. That is not a plausible value given our data. So we would probably report our mean. We would say the mean is 42.3, 99% confidence interval is this, 36.3, 48.3. And then we would give our hypothesis test decision. We reject the null hypothesis and we can put p is less than 0.01 because we know p has to be less than 0.01 the way it worked out with my little fudging here and i actually hedge that a bit and i can go into more detail at some point but i won't right now and we can conclude that far residents eat statistically significant now that term statistically significant what it means is we did a hypothesis test so statistically significant means we did a hypothesis test and we rejected the null hypothesis so they eat statistically significantly fewer ice cream cones per year than the state average, which was 50 per year. So now the cable company again. Let's go through that in kind of old cable company example. Cable company, uh, the mean length of cables last year was 1,237 millimeters, right? And let's say that the mean we've been dealing with so far, this population mean, that now something has changed. There's a new machine. Is it producing cables with the same thickness? Well, let's say we want to use alpha equals 0.05 for this. So we get a sample from the new machine. We sample randomly 250 cables. Um, actually, was I going to say thickness? I can't decide if it's length or thickness. It's length. Fine. We sample 250 cables from the new machine. And the mean that we get there is bigger than, it's higher, longer than the average. So the average from the rest of the company up before we had the new machine was 1237. So all the other machines, their average is 1237 millimeters. But this one has 1250 millimeters. Sample size of 250. Let's assume the same standard deviation as the factory average so that we can go through these calculations. So our hypotheses, the null hypothesis is that the new machine produces cables with a mean length no different from the factory average. And the alternative hypothesis is that the new machine produces cables with a mean length that is different from the factory average. So a non-directional hypothesis, kind of natural here, and I didn't have to force it into this non-directional mold. The math version or the symbol version would be the null hypothesis mu of the new machine is 1237, and the alternative mu of the new machine is not 1237. So kudos if you get all that out. Here's the uh, confidence interval I calculated for this. 1234.6 to 1265.4. And actually the mean of other machines is inside that. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. So the new machine might be doing just fine. It might be consistent with the other ones. So we would probably report our sample and our confidence interval. The sample from the new machine had a mean length of 1250 millimeters, 95% confidence interval is these numbers. And then we report the results of our hypothesis test. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. The evidence does not suggest that the machine produces cables with a mean length significantly different from the other machines, which was 1237. P is greater than 0 0.05. 0 0.05 because alpha was 0 0.05 because the confidence interval was 0 0.95. Two tails. Now here's another one. From survey data, it is known that the mean age of college students in an engineering program somewhere is 21.5 years old with a standard deviation of 3.4 years. So some Professor Johnson thinks that mechanical engineering students are actually older. So he takes a random sample of 25 mechanical engineering students 
and finds that their mean is 22.6 years old. And he says, I'm just going to assume that their standard deviation, or the standard deviation of the population they came from, because this is sigma, not s, that the population of all, um, the standard deviation of all mechanical engineering students has, a, has the same standard deviation as the population of all engineering students in general. So that's probably a reasonable assumption. And if not, it's good for our, our uh, work right here. So is Professor Johnson's hunch correct? The stated no alternative hypothesis is clearly directional, but we're going to cram this into a, a non-directional mode by using a hypothesis test. So I'm not going to worry about teaching you how to adjust it. I'll just say, let's make it non-directional. Non let's just flip it and make it non-directional here. So the hypotheses, no hypothesis would be something like mechanical engineering students are the same age on average as other engineering students. Another way to say that is they come from the same population, that their age is drawn from the same population of ages as other students. We often say that, that the null hypothesis says you come from the same population as something, and the alternative hypothesis says your sample came from a different population. That's a common way to phrase it. The alternative hypothesis says mechanical engineering students are older on average than other engineering students. In other words, to follow my little reasoning before, you come from a population with um, a, a higher age. So the math version, I'm just going to do a not equals, and this is where I'm forcing, uh, I'm forcing a non-directional frame onto what is clearly a directional hypothesis as stated by Professor Johnson. But I'm just going to say the null hypothesis is that the mechanical engineering students true population mean is 21.5. The alternative is that the mechanical engineering's true population uh, mean is not 21.5. Now I'm going to show the, the uh, data here from the confidence interval. So my confidence interval, I calculated 21.3 and 23.9, and no hypothesis value was 21.5 because that's the mean of the other mechanical or the other engineering students, all engineering students together. So you can see uh, the mechanical engineering students are older on average, but at least in sample wise, they seem older. But we're not confident that it's happening in the population because it's still possible we could get a sample like this. One of our, it's still plausible that even if this was the population mean that the sample would happen. So we can't reject the null hypothesis here. The null hypothesis is still one of our plausible values for where the mean of all possible, or yeah, the mean of all mechanical engineering student ages might have come from. This is still plausible, so we do not reject the null hypothesis. So here's a nice conclusion we could write. When we put in the part about failing to reject the null hypothesis, we put the p-value. We don't know the specific value, but we do know that it's greater than 0.05, and we did not reject the null hypothesis. Um, there we go. So I'm done with, with this module for now, and we'll get a little bit more content in class. And of course, feel free to read the textbook, as occasionally students have been known to do in the history of college. And we'll have a really fun exam on this pretty soon. Good luck.